Um, I'm going to be um, talking about, uh, as, as Zoe said, the evolution of geospatial workloads uh, on AWS. I'm a public sector solutions architect based in uh, Melbourne, in Victoria. Uh, and so I work with mainly sort of state government agencies in Victoria, but also um, I've worked with some of the federal agencies who are headquartered in Melbourne, like Australia Post and the Bureau of Meteorology. Uh, so I'm going to talk about a few things today. I'm going to talk to the kind of progression of this kind of workload on cloud. A lot of the principles that I'll talk about don't just apply to geospatial load. A lot of them apply to kind of any kind of workload, but there's, there's, there's a few that are, are specific. Um, I'm going to talk about how to, customers have reduced licensing costs um, by moving their geospatial workloads onto uh, AWS Cloud. Also, importantly, about reversing the pattern for caching, so, um, which is kind of a big one. It's like a, a mental model a jump that you need to make to use Cloud the best way. Um, you can certainly just pop stuff on Cloud the way that you've got it structured on-prem, but um, you can make stuff a lot more efficient, cost-optimized, and more scalable uh, by reversing a couple of the normal patterns. Um, and, and more generally, just talking about some of the services you can use to, to leverage our scale for geospatial workloads. And um, a subject really close to my heart, stop dragging your data around. A lot of the time I talk to customers who say, oh, I can't, I've got big data, that I, it's too big, I can't download it, I can't upload it, our network's not big enough. Um, th that kind of thinking ref reflects, you know, a need to move things around in the first place. And I'm going to talk about the way that people are using uh, cloud so that they no longer actually have to move their data at all. Um, I'm going to take about sort of five and a half hours to do this presentation. No, it's a 30 minute presentation and, um, and after that we'll probably we'll, we'll, we'll be done for the day. Um, this is a really interesting little site. Um, this is a, um, a map from the Swiss topographical office. Um, the Swiss Topo office is sort of famous for making some of the world's most beautiful maps, and obviously they have a beautiful country, um, and the Topo maps that they've produced over the years are very well known. This is actually a screenshot from a website, and um, the point of this website is that the kind of left half of the screen is actually just a scan of their paper topographical map, and the right half of the screen is actually the Esri stack rendering of the same map. Um, and if you, it's like Swiss Topo, Esri, if you Google those things, you'll find it. It's like a Esri story map. Um, the point of it is, you know, that red line in the middle, if you go there, you can kind of slide the thing left and right, and you can zoom in and out, and go, wow, you know, this map looks more or less just like the old hand-drawn one. Uh, and that kind of represents, I guess, the start of an evolution. It's like just trying to reproduce what we already had with paper. Um, except kind of smaller and worse resolution than paper, of course, because paper's this big. Um, it's a really neat site. Um, have a look at it. But it reflects the same kind of thinking that people first have when they start moving their infrastructure onto cloud. And so a typical Esri stack infrastructure uh, on cloud, sort of a knee-jerk reaction, would be to do something like this. So you've got a VPC, which is like a virtual private cloud, right? So isolated resources. And then we're going to need some application servers, and we're going to need a database server. So at the most basic level, OK, I need to basically spin up some, some VMs, right? Some EC2 instances. Even at this most basic level, that's not how you would normally do it. So uh, even if it's just an Esri stack, um, you know, or anything else with a, with a database backend, typically customers will use RDS. And with something where you may well be using, say, an Oracle or a Microsoft SQL Server backend um, in your current infrastructure, uh, if you're talking about, say, Esri, in fact, uh, Esri themselves support SQL, Oracle, and Postgres, and some other database flavors. But so 95% of customers who move an Esri workload onto us actually move it from whatever it's running on now to Postgres, uh, because uh, RDS is a managed platform. So, uh, relational database service, we manage the, um, the patching, um, the upgrades, the operating system. You just say, I would like a database server this big, and I would like this many I.O. Like basically, you say what performance you need, and that's all you need to do. And of course, the application end of that, in the case of an Esri stack, is obviously managed by the application vendor, in this case, Esri. So it's kind of a no-brainer, because there's no downside, it's supported, um, it still works, it's still performant, but of course you take away the commercial licensing for the database because, because 
Postgres, of course, is an open source database platform. Um, so this is one way that customers actually um, save a lot on licensing just by making that one simple change. And, and that's a really simple change to make. You're basically just saying, my database connection now goes to RDS. That reflects, though, a kind of a bigger pattern of how you should think about workloads when you're moving them to cloud. So um, it's always tempting to just sort of pick up what you've got and, and maybe change it a little bit and sort of plop it on cloud. But by thinking about the native services that you can leverage, you can make the amount of infrastructure that you have to manage smaller and less expensive. And what you need to do is think about that from the kind of outside in. And in IT, we're kind of accustomed to having to run everything ourselves, you know, having to provision everything ourselves and kind of thinking you know, from the inside. And it's like, well, I'm going to build this stuff, and then oh, how am I going to put DDoS protection in front of it, or how am I going to do this or that? But instead, come at it from the outside and work your way in. And so on this diagram, sort of at the you know, top, I've got global services. So we've got a number of global level services. This is not a comprehensive list of services by any means. I've just picked out a couple that are typically relevant to GIS type workloads. And so in the top part, we've got global services. Um, CDN, so Content Delivery Network, um, CloudFront, so caching at the edge, um, but that's also where we do um, a lot of the DDoS protection that's actually built into the platform. Um, as Teresa mentioned, it's like that's, that's built in at no additional cost. Um, there's like a Shield Advanced version you can get, um, you know, which has got sort of extra features, but um, uh, that's also where we have uh, WAF, so um, Web Application Firewall. And uh, that's also, you know, we've got global services for DNS. And so as soon, if you start thinking like that from outside, yeah, okay, we've got some services, so what? The point is, that's all happening way away from your infrastructure. So you've already handled DNS, DDoS, um, content delivery before you've provisioned any infrastructure at all. So your infrastructure, you know, my virtual private cloud is now in the little blue box in the bottom middle of the screen. And I haven't even got down to the sort of regional services yet. So that's global. Um, then regional, so we've got multiple regions, as we call them. So Sydney's a region, um, and so pretty much all of my Australian government customers have all got their operations running uh, out of Sydney. And, and so then inside a region, we then provide services like load balancing and S3, etc. cetera. Uh, so something like S3, the object store, which is, I, is kind of a theme that I've got running through this. I think it's probably the most underrated service that we have. You drop something in, a, in an S3 bucket, okay, so what? I'll get in a minute, you'll see how powerful that is for actually delivering geospatial content. Um, it's not just a, a dumb storage bucket. But so you get down to the regional services you can use like um, serverless, you know, for example, um, or RDS as a regional service. Interesting one here is um, Amazon Workspaces. So you can get like a GPU enabled desktop in the Sydney region, so in the cloud. Why would I want that? Well, for example, uh, uh, Esri, and I'm not just going to talk about uh, Esri um, in this presentation, but e Esri themselves needed a platform to roll out the 3D version of their desktop um, software. So their kind of flagship software is their desktop version, and their, the pro version that they've, that they've now rolled out is, is 3D and so requires um, a GPU on the desktop. And they had a problem where they needed to roll that out um, to get the training done for that to thousands of people around the world thousands of people who didn't necessarily have GPU and had an inconsistent platform and so on. And they actually, I think in the first half of last year, they were on the uh, preview of GPU workspaces, which subsequently last year went live. And they used the preview version to train thousands of people around the world. Um, they love that because it's a standard platform for them to run on. So they don't have to worry about the you know, thousand different flavors of GPU cards and drivers and so on, all the support issues that come along with that. And also, by running the, um, the desktop software in the cloud, you're running the desktop software, which is quite chatty, right next to the servers. And so you've got your desktops and your servers running in the cloud next to each other. And so it performs really, really well. And then what you do is you're just pushing the pixels of the screen back down to the users who are using it. I'm gonna um, tell a couple of customer stories now. 
And um, the first one's actually about the Bureau of Meteorology. So uh, going back about sort of three years ago or so, um, Japan launched a really beautiful uh, satellite called Himawari. And uh, what you're looking at now is actually just some images from one day of Himawari stitched together. And so this satellite um, shoots in incredibly high resolution. The images come through every 10 minutes uh, in multiple spectra. So of course, we're just looking at the visible spectra here. Um, and so you can imagine, and, and, and this is, a, of course, it's a, it's a geostationary satellite, because the point, the point is it's pointed at Japan, of course. But as you probably know, the, the, um, the different weather organizations around the world, they all share data with each other. And so understandably, the Bureau of Meteorology was very excited about this satellite, because the resolution of this is actually high enough. You can zoom up on Japan. And of course, Japan's a smaller country than Australia. This has the resolution, you can zoom up quite tight on Australia. And so what the Bureau of Meteorology did was they took this and they said, well, we can build like a little application where you could actually like browse and zoom kind of map style around Australia and then look at the cloud cover and then kind of press play and then see the cloud cover for the last several hours actually moving. So they'd written this application and um, and then they'd done, they'd done some performance testing and done the numbers on how much bandwidth this was going to consume to release to the Australian public. And they came to an alarming conclusion because um, BombGov.au was already one of the most popular sites in Australia. Uh, and the Bureau are running you know, a couple of dozen servers across multiple data centres um, to sort of service that size load. And this one application was going to double that amount of bandwidth. Um, so it was going to produce as much load as the whole of the rest of um, BombGov.au put together. And so they came to us and said, well, we've got this problem. You know, we, we, we want to launch this application, um, you know, but we rapidly need to actually scale up. And we're at capacity in our current data centers, at capacity for network, et cetera. Uh, so how can we do this? And, 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 and I guess the, the model that they kind of that they had in mind, more or less, was something like this. And, th and this is the way most people would think about the problem to begin with. So, you know, you've got updates coming through from the satellite. You have to have a tile processor. Uh, and basically, the tile processor takes, you know, a photo, and obviously you have to do some reprojection, right? Because you're, you're taking a photo, and you have to reproject it back into a flat map tile. And so the tile processor would take that and then put it in some kind of cache, uh, and this is a super common model, right? So you've got a cache, and maybe the case is shared between multiple servers, and maybe each server's got its own cache. There's different ways of doing this. Um, but basically, that kind of tile cache then has to get served out to the application. And the application itself was like, a, it's a JavaScript application, right? So it's basically just a, it's a web page with a bunch of JavaScript. Um, and that has to get served off some servers as well. And then, of course, you know, then you could potentially put a, you know, content delivery network in front of it to accelerate and so on. But so this is not how you would build it on AWS. Um, in fact, the idea of having servers to serve all that stuff is actually just not needed at all in this case. Um, in order to build that, in fact, pretty much all you need is S3. So S3 is a simple storage service. Um, the thing that people often miss about it is it's actually a server. So you can turn on web access for an S3 bucket. Uh, S3 is scaled so that it, 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 holds, um, it holds billions of objects, but it scales to millions of requests per second. Uh, and, you can do, and so you get this sort of enormous global scale web server uh, just by turning on web access on an S3 bucket. That's really significant, because it meant, essentially, the tile processor could still be one little server that was managed by the Bureau. It would take the feeds, generate the tiles, and just put them in S3. And the JavaScript application, because it's a web page, the JavaScript application itself can also be served by S3. And so, instead of having dozens of servers to manage and scale and have auto-scaling and all this kind of stuff, just put it in S3 and have one little server. And if that one little server goes down, actually, there's no outage either. So even the one server that they've got is not even critical for delivering the workload. And then, of course, we still put Shield and CloudFront um, in front of that solution. If we had have done it today, because this was a couple of years ago now, we actually would have used Lambda for the tile processor. 
So we've got Lambda, for, it was just function of, as a service. And so what you would do is you'd have the Himawari feed come through into an S3 bucket, that would trigger a Lambda function, process the tiles, put it back in the S3 bucket, and then they'd be available to serve. And so if you built this now, there'd actually be no servers at all in the solution. Um, and so this was launched about sort of three or four weeks after they first came and talked to us, it was on the ABC News, and you can go to satview, bomb.gov.au, uh, and take a look at it. The, the main point that I'm trying to make here is that you know, S3, you know, when you set up um, a, a part of S3, it's called an S3 bucket, right? And a bucket sounds kind of dopey, you know? It, it's, it's cool in as much as, okay, I'll put something in a bucket, and when I come back later, I can take it out again. Uh, but it's not this kind of bucket, it's this kind of bucket. So it's bucket plus transport. Um, and I'll come back to this idea later um, of how powerful it is to use it sort of not just as a sort of storage thing where I can come back later and get it, but, but, but also to deliver. The next customer I'm going to talk about is Emergency Management Victoria. So uh, you may recall that in 2009 uh, we had some really terrible bushfires in Victoria uh, and there was a Royal Commission subsequent because um, of the, the scale of loss of life in those um, bushfires. And out of that and some other things came Emergency Management Victoria, where um, we have a kind of a, a, uh, an agency that really crosses the different emergency services and provides central coordination and also notification to the public. Uh, so Emergency Management Victoria are responsible for um, notifying Victorians now of actually any kind of emergency, not just bushfires. And um, one of the things that was identified in the Royal Commission was that the the old IT systems actually didn't scale in the event of an emergency, um, and that that was one of the contributing factors. Now, um, so the EMV website um, and mobile application, um, you know, it, it's really neat. You can go in, you can register, um, say who you are, where you live, also say maybe you've got a holiday house or you're interested in, you know, your mum or your dad's house or something like that, and essentially establish some geofences that say these are areas that I care about in terms of notification. Uh, so you can go in, you log in, you, you, know, you say that's an area you care about, and then if, say, a fire happens, they then need to do some queries, find out it, who do we need to notify, and then they have a target of being able to notify um, two million people in a couple of minutes. Now, when they first br brought this workload to us, um, they, they, they did kind of take the, the older architecture that they had um, and kind of put it on cloud. And they got a lot of benefits out of that. They got auto-scaling, and so they had a solution uh, you know, that, that would scale and meet the sort of the large-scale needs of the public, but it looked something kind of like this. This is like a simplified version. Um, they had about sort of 25 servers, five load balancers. There was a lot of complexity, uh, and they spent a lot of time worrying about, and you can kind of see this in the bottom half, a lot of time worrying about uh, different copies of databases and reads and write copies and... Um, they had quite a complicated process that in the event that you had a data center fail, um, you know, that it would do a failover to the other data center. And so they kind of picked up their old active passive DR model as well. Uh, you know, whereas if you did something natively on AWS, you can have an active active model instead of DR. Um, but so there, there, there was a great deal of complexity. But in the end, you know, an incident feeds in one side and then ultimately notifications uh, feed out the other side. They did a sort of a large re-engineering project to say, well, okay, we're going to rewrite this so that it's cloud native. And, and this is what it looks like today. So today, if someone, someone logs on to register on the website, that whole website is served to them off S3. And then they fill out a form, and there's some JavaScript, which got served off S3. And they submit the form, and the results of that actually go into an RDS database, and so they do have an RDS database because they need some spatial queries, right? So they've got a Postgres database which runs the, the Postgres spatial extensions. And so, so that user data gets stored in there. When an incident happens, um, an incident actually gets treated as, um, as a thing that winds up as a, as a GeoJSON in S3. And that triggers Lambda functions. And so the Lambda functions is like a sort of array of sort of Lambda functions. Um, and then that then worries about querying the database and finding out who I need to notify, and then using SNS to go ahead and you know, notify all these people. But so they're using all these um, native AWS services, and they have 
literally one server remaining uh, that they manage themselves, and it manages the, their content management system. And so they've got a CMS, and a person logs on and actually can, to, can do updates in the CMS, but whatever they do actually just gets published to S3. And so that CMS server can actually go down and it has no impact on the system. And all of the things you see outside the VPC, outside the stuff that they kind of have to manage themselves, they're all regional services. And so you put something in S3 bucket, we are writing it to three data centers. Um, you know, you, you, you put something in an RDS database that's a multi-AZ, as it should be if it's a production database, we're synchronously writing that to two different data centers. Um, there's a whole level of worry that they don't have in operation, but for this one, it's even more significant than that because you can imagine this is a real nightmare of an IT workload because for most of the year, this system is practically unused. Through winter, when there's nothing wrong, there's no emergencies happening, you know, this is an IT system that just lies dormant. And so from a cost point of view, it's terrific to have it lying dormant using Lambda because you're not actually paying for anything. You know, they're paying essentially for the database and all of the other stuff is just literally being used. But doing it the conventional way, you've also got a system where 90% of the year it's unused and then suddenly this is massive peak load and it absolutely has to work and lives depend on it. And so this takes away a whole level of worry about the IT infrastructure um, that this system runs on. But this, this evolution that you see from having lots of servers in a VPC to having a small number and leveraging native services, it means you get an, app, an application that's more resilient and, and it's also much more cost effective. To continue the kind of S3 thread, um, I'm going to talk for a minute about a project that um, you've probably heard of and that actually got mentioned a couple of times today, uh, which is the Geoscience Australia Data Cube. So um, if you haven't heard about it today, you might have seen it in the press, but um, so this is actually a joint venture between um, Geoscience Australia and CSIRO um, and, and also the Bureau of Meteorology. And, um, and fundamentally what it is is that um, it makes available to researchers um, different types of data in a really consistent, uh, consistent way geospatially, and the sort of data cube idea is to sort of standardise, uh, you know, on a grid, and then project say over time, and then you get this you get this idea of sort of three dimensions like a cube. And um, in particular, you know, Geoscience Australia were interested in a lot of Earth observation data, and where they were a couple of years ago was here. So uh, this is a slide from them. Um, and you can see the little red lines back in 2014, 15. And they were looking at the volume of data that they wanted to make available uh, for this kind of research. And Earth observation data in particular is increasing at a really rapid rate. You know, if you think back to the, the little sort of Himawari stitched together uh, video from the, from the start, so that's data that comes every 10 minutes. Uh, and, and that's not even really big compared to, you know, some of the, um, the, the data of the size like the people like Digital Globe um, are collecting every day. Um, you know, Digital Globe were actually uh, one of our first customers for our snowmobile, you know, which is the container that you can get to shift 100 petabytes at a time. Uh, you know, Digital Globe actually have more than 100 petabytes to shift around. And so Geoscientists Australia were looking at this and Combine the, the, the amount of Earth observation data that they were looking at consuming with the fact that if you look at um, analysts like, say, Forrester and, um, and Gartner, they put the cost of enterprise storage at somewhere between kind of five and ten thousand uh, dollars per terabyte per year. That's delivered to the user. That's not like a terabyte of hard disk. That's a terabyte of duplicated, rated, copied across multiple locations, backed up to a third location, enterprise quality data. And so if you take that and apply it to this, that means that the numbers going up the left-hand side more or less translate to millions of dollars per year. You know, so they were looking at consuming a massive part of their budget just in storage before they even did the first bit of work or, or had anything available. Uh, and, and that also means if you're going to try and keep up with that rate of growth of data, you're also going to spend a whole lot of energy just worrying about you know, that um, on-prem that on storage 
And then also, you have to have a bunch of compute near that on-prem storage. It's, it, it's this kind of um, increasing scale problem. And so rather than do that, um, they built a model that actually uses S3. Because uh, we talked about before the fact that it's, it's an object store and you can use it to, to, to deliver stuff, but then you can build layers on top of that. And so imagine you've got your Earth observation data, say, sitting um, in S3. It can be delivered different places, but also then on top of that, um, you can build like an index and a metadata store, which allows you to then sort of search um, you know, what's in your S3 buckets. Uh, and we've actually got some native services like Athena to help you with that, depending on what type of data you've got. And then once a user's got sort of an area or like or a cube sort of identified, then, you know, that, that, then those sort of portions of all of those petabytes of S3 data, then some portions might get temporarily loaded up into some machines. Um, and that's where, you know, you might load that up into sort of different kind of clusters, ultimately probably put it in RAM on some machines and, you know, do some fancy analysis. And then after your analysis is done, then park those resources, whatever they are, um, and so shut them down again. And so you might temporarily pay for some compute resources, but you don't have like a, a, a gigantic, say, you know, HPC cluster or, you know, a, a, a big MapReduce cluster or whatever it is that's running all the time. You just temporarily ingest it and then leave it back lie again in S3. And this is this idea of building a data lake. Um, and so it's increasingly common to build a geospatial data lake because geospatial has rapidly turned into a big data problem. The thing that people still do though, or they tend to do when they move to cloud, is reproduce the silos that they have on-prem. And so as a government department or an agency, you know, you've, you've, you've got your own racks, you've got your own machines, you've got your own storage, you paid for your own fancy storage array, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And if another department wants to use that data, then well, you have to get it over there, you know, and you'll copy it, maybe stick it on some hard drives, put it in the post, however it gets over there, and it moves over to a different silo. If you're talking about, say, Earth observation data, that's actually pretty silly. If you've got a set of Earth observation data that's sitting in S3, why not consume it in S3? And if you're an agency that provides data to other agencies, you know, like for example, a, a number of my customers, they roll up geospatial data. So they take it from, say, a local council level and then roll it up at, say, a state level. And then they actually then share it back out with all of their other state government agencies. And that's data that's literally getting shipped around town on hard drives. If instead of that, one agency aggregated it and then just allowed other agencies to read it, and you can do that with really fine-grained permissions. It doesn't have to be public data. You know, you can, you can, you can aggregate that data and then give each agency appropriate permissions to read that data. And you can even set it up so that that agency pays for the transfer of reading the data. Um, you know, you, you don't, if, if it's a large volume thing and you're uncomfortable with bearing the cost of the download, you can set it up um, so that the person reading it pays the bill for, the, for reading it instead of you. But so doing this, why make more than one copy of the data? And so on top of the fact that S3 is already sort of more efficient and powerful than trying to store stuff on-prem, rather than having 10 or 20 copies of this data around government, why not just have one copy? You know, we can, we, we can make it more efficient. You've got then a single authoritative source of the data. Um, if you put something on S3, if you turn on version control, then if someone deletes it, you've actually still got the old version. You can set it up so that you need like kind of root credentials and MFA and whatever to change policy. And I've got a lot of customers who just say, well, I'm gonna put something, one thing in S3, that's my single authoritative source. I don't back it up. I don't have another, another copy. That's my copy. Um, that's incredibly efficient. And then each different customer, and so this could be different, different sort of sections of one agency, or this could be multiple agencies, or it doesn't matter who there's separate AWS accounts, the different ones, each of them consume that data in their own way. The first customer might just use EC2, the second one might use Lambda, um, et cetera, et cetera. As a kind of demo of this sort of powerful idea, um, we've set up this site, um, 
amazon.com slash earth. And if you haven't already seen it, it's definitely worth a look. Uh, but what we've done is, is, um, is highlight some open data sets. So some data sets that um, anyone can actually consume. And in a couple of these cases, we've actually just hosted that data set ourselves. Um, you know, so in, in the case of, uh, you know, for example, some of the, the Landsat imagery, where we actually, we, we pay to host that on S3 and anybody can consume it. And we're doing that as a kind of demo of that model. Because it's like, well, wow, that's a massive data set, right? That's petabytes right there. Uh, what use is that to me? I, I can't download that. Well, you don't need to download it, right? It's sitting in an AWS region. If you want to do some analysis on that data set, just spin up some compute next to that data set. Don't copy it anywhere. Get over this idea that you have to copy the data somewhere, that you have to move it. The storage of all of this data is getting exponentially larger. And so just stop moving it altogether. And so the takeaways um, from this session are, so to, to begin with, if you think back to the where we started on that journey, uh, Start by reducing things like the number of servers and the amount of DB licensing by making your infrastructure smaller, and also by leveraging native services like RDS that allow you to move to, um, to database platforms that are a lot less expensive to run. Um, leverage AWS scale. You know, think about the S3 example, the, the CDN example. Use those scale uh, services to make your footprint of servers smaller, which um, gives you a much more efficient, less expensive, and probably more resilient solution. Uh, reverse the patternification. So remember, instead of building a cache behind a bunch of servers, think about building an S3 cache in front of the servers that keeps the load off those servers in the first place. Spin up compute near the data. So super important. You know, stop thinking about, you know, if, you, if you're consuming some digital globe data, think about not downloading it and, and having it on-prem. Think about leaving it in the cloud and, and having the compute next to it. And, and finally, and kind of close to my heart, don't move those silos to the cloud. You know, share the data, data, don't copy it. You know, have a single authoritative source, and then you can share that with other agencies without having them copy it around. Uh, and finally, um, I've just got a couple of URLs if you want to do some follow-up reading. Um, like I say, S3 is our oldest service. It's like 11 years old now, um, and it's probably one of our most underrated and, and most powerful. Um, RDS um, slash Earth, if you haven't seen it, um, the, those sort of the, the, the pretty stripes and the different images at the top of the page, but if you scroll down, there's a bunch of good video case studies and, um, and some really useful information. Um, and slash uh, Big Data um, has got some really interesting reading. And uh, thank you very much. <laughs>